please join me uh, in welcoming to the stage in just a minute um, Justin Malilo from Mona, Annie Phillips from IRL Art, uh, Clara Volstead, an artist, and Jonathan Palmer from Peregrine will moderate this discussion. And after this, we're going to break for lunch, and I want to give you a heads up that the next after lunch, we're going to have a live pitch session. So if you're thinking about building in the metaverse or otherwise, and you're looking for partners, developers, collaborators, start thinking about it, because we're going to have a time to reach out to all of you to get those ideas. Welcome up. All right. Hello again. Hello. All right. Hello again, everybody. I'm Jonathan Palmer. I'm the creative director of Peregrine. I was just in the previous, uh, in Avatar in the previous uh, session before the last one. So this is what I look like in the meat space. Um, I am really excited about this panel. We've got some incredible people here joining us today. Um, I'd love to do a quick introduction for everybody and at the same time kind of showcase just a quick little visual of some of the work that you guys are doing. So if you guys could pull up my computer screen, I'll, uh, I'll introduce you, Clara. Clara's an incredible 3D artist and animator. Um, she hails from, uh, <laughs> from Canada, and uh, so came down specifically for this. And uh, what I love about this is in her work, I see this really uh, deeply, incredibly uh, ex expression of the blend between humanity and like the digital world. And so that's something really exciting about your work that I love. Um, you guys can check out some more of her stuff in the, in the gallery over there. Um, well, we, we have Annie. Let's see here. Where are we going here? Annie from IRL Art. Uh, and so she is a gallery curator, artist in her own right. And uh, basically, Annie with IRL Art and their team with Yule and a bunch of other people build these incredible metaverse installations that blend the reality from in real life into the metaverse. And so her team is responsible for a lot of the build that we have in the other room. And uh, she's also an incredible onboarder of artists into the space bridging that gap from the traditional arts and creative entertainment businesses and bringing those people into the space to help us tell great stories. Um, and finally, I have Justin, um, who is the CEO of Mona. And uh, Mona Galleries is this really incredible, accessible uh, version of the metaverse that's available inside of web browsers, which really increases the accessibility of these worlds and uh, the other thing that I love about the Mona stuff is the fidelity in Mona is exceptional. So it, it ranks on the high end of the spectrum as far as the quality and the experience. Um, so it's a really incredible thing. And um, basically, Mona was started through Tachyon and uh, is uh, supported by Filecoin and a really big piece of the metaverse and Filecoin uh, world. So thank you guys all for joining me here today. I think kind of what's in unique about this is we have kind of the artist, the curator, and then the infrastructure. So we have some really diverse uh, perspectives. Um, to get us started, I would love to ask you, Claire, I'll kick this to you, but uh, in a broad sense, this is an ongoing story of the relationship between humans and technology, right? This is another chapter in that. And uh, I would love to explore like how you see that kind of marriage between technology and humanity and expression of human, uh, deeply human traits. Yeah, of course. Um, I believe that the metaverse and 3D sculpture within the metaverse is kind of an extension of the human experience in a lot of ways. Like if you think about how much our, of our lives are spent on the internet, experiencing art, talking to our friends, the social connection we have to the internet, it makes sense that so much of our culture is building into the internet. So having work and uh, the communities exist inside of that just makes so much sense, right? And I think being able to create artwork that's experienced entirely digitally just is so like key to the way that humanity is really evolving. Yeah, and so when you see this, uh, for all of you guys, when you see this space emerging with the three-dimensional nature of this, how is this uh, different from potentially like websites in 2D? Yeah, uh, I can... Uh chime in here. We sort of view, especially at Mono, we view the future of the internet uh, not just based in Web3, but we see the future of the internet being 3D. And really, that's why we're excited about empowering creators and 3D artists like Clara and like Annie and the work they're doing at IRL Art to really be able to produce and display and show off their work at the highest fidelity. Uh, it's super, super important that 
we have as many tools as possible that make this really accessible for creators to build in 3D and then to make these 3D environments and 3D assets available uh, and really accessible for anyone via the web browser. Uh, we, we definitely just see the future of the internet being 3D and being able to immerse yourself, not just through a, a 2D screen on a desktop, but eventually through an AR headset. Yeah, all that technology is evolving really quickly, and uh, it's really interesting to see how it plays out. Uh, to you, Annie, I'd be curious, as a curator, um, what types of things have you seen with artists when they get like in the virtual spaces with, whether it's 3D or just 2D art that's displayed virtually like that, how does that change the experience of it from potentially just looking at a, a, a browser screen? Oh, absolutely. I mean, so our niche is really recreating physical environments. And for us, it's all about accessibility as well as documentation. So it's, it's kind of two or threefold. But ultimately, we recognize just the power of bridging a global community and the diverse perspectives and bridge building that can happen through just connecting on that larger scale. And so creating that accessibility, but also documenting our work. I think historically digital art is pretty ephemeral, uh, whether it's performance-based visuals or you know, a talk, like thankfully now we're recording it, we're live streaming and all of these things, but I think it's all an effort to better document and to share the research and the education and really learning together. And I think ultimately that just deepens that curiosity both as a viewer and someone who's enjoying the artwork because they can just see so much more that's gone into it and it just, you know, puts you down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we're, we're all here, just, you heard the word a ton of times, metaverse, metaverse, metaverse. And it means a lot of things to different people. It's so awesome to say, it's so buzzy, you feel cool. But uh, Justin, you have a really, you guys have really focused on the definition for your company specifically and how you think about metaverse. I'm wondering if you'd share that with us because I thought it was really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So we define the metaverse as an interconnected network of virtual worlds that in many cases underpin the physical world. Um, and so everything that we're doing at Mona is really making these tools accessible for artists and 3D creators and developers to freely and openly develop, build, upload 3D assets, these incredible 3D immersive interactive environments, um, upload them to the web where they're actually stored and decentralized on IPFS, and then they're actually able to go and sell these virtual worlds uh, as tokenized assets. So each of the virtual worlds in Mona are NFTs themselves. And we see this as a really uh, important position to be in uh, as opposed to kind of capitalizing on this sort of land sale model and this virtual sort of artificial scarcity and really just make uh, these tools accessible for creators to be able to tokenize, sell, share, display, and explore uh, incredible immersive virtual environments together. Yeah, that NFT and the, 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 the idea of digital ownership uh, is one of those primitives I think is really important. Perhaps, Claire, you could tell us a little bit from an artist's perspective, and we can maybe make that jump again to different types of artists, but what does it mean as a digital artist to have digital ownership over your work, and, and how, how does that in the artistic sense uh, feel for you? I think um, being able to have ownership over digital artwork opens doors to so many different possibilities, whether that be enabling like different communities to make work on much grander scale or allowing like people to experience it without the um, without the gatekeeping level of like needing you know massive funds to create a work. You know, NFTs give validity to art forms that otherwise would not have validity, right? Like. Before NFTs, how would you sell, say, a 3D rendering of something if it's not directly for a company, you know? Like, my work doesn't work without NFTs. And um, there's always the argument, you know, make commissions, do this, sell prints. But NFTs enable the actual, like, free expression of what I'm trying to do and what so many other people are trying to do fully digitally to be enjoyed and rewarded in a way that's you know, most beneficial to the artist and not to a company trying to take advantage of an artist. 
Yeah. So maybe you guys can, I don't know who wants to take this one, but talk us through some of, you know, and NFTs can represent anything, right? It's not just, pick, it's not just a JPEG, for example. And uh, in this world, we're, we're talking about things like avatars, we're talking about actual worlds and models and builds. What are some of the other components that are a part of this that make that up? Well, I think there's all sorts of assets. You can have your name, your digital clothing. Uh, some metaverses have the model where you own the parcel and that gives you rights to build. And I think it was so mind-blowing when Mona came out because as a digital creator, you know, when you, people say, oh, make a print or something, it feels uh, static or it's not that real digital experience that your work was intended for. And so I felt like Mona was such a breakthrough to not, not only not have to buy a parcel to build, but then to be able to transfer a full 3D environment as an NFT. And I think that, you know, similarly with mod, um, Platforms like Async are really neat where you can add in programmability. And I see similarities with Mona of being able to determine the level of interaction that the buyer of the NFT can have on your space. And I think that there's, we're really just seeing the beginnings of that. And I think that, again, with Mona, it's just so incredible to give those tools to the artist and, and to see how that plays out. Yeah, perhaps Justin to follow that up is like, what are some of the most incredible, unique things you maybe didn't expect seeing built with Mona now that you've enabled that? Well, I mean, I have to shout out Annie and, and Yule and IRL Art because one of the first spaces that was built in Mona was actually a one-to-one -one, uh, representation of their IRL Art Gallery in Denver. So they actually built a physical twin in the metaverse in Mona that they were able to tokenize. So seeing things like that is really exciting. Um, I mean, it's pretty incredible, you know, when you remove all sorts of limitations from the creation process for artists and for 3D artists, uh, it really enables all sorts of different um, experiences to be built, not just super photorealistic 3D environments, but we have people who are building scavenger hunts, escape rooms, uh, sort of squid game-esque spaces, but then also super, super stylized ones. You know, these are 3D environments, but they almost feel like a 2D painting that you're stepping through. There are many examples inside of Mona where you feel like, if you're familiar with the Pixar visual development book where you kind of see these incredible paintings that are, are made as sort of concept art for a film, some of the spaces feel like you're actually stepping through a painting, stepping through a, a work of concept art. So it's, yeah, it's really incredible seeing just that, that range and breadth of what uh, creators can do when you really just give them the proper tools. And it's, it's really surprising how you can't get from A to B, like A to C, it's like this really interesting thing. Once the tools are there, that things emerge that you never even could predict. Um, let's talk a little bit about how this intersects with Web3. So we've got these things. You come from a gaming background and VR and, and uh, AR, all that sort of thing. And then with Web3, we have a lot of these same shared value prop, uh, beliefs or, or you know, open, interoperable, right? These are things that we talk about a lot in Web3 and they're now merging with a lot of this uh, technology. What are some of the most important sort of like key kind of cornerstone concepts you think that people should think about with regard to specifically the open metaverse? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm sure Clara and Annie will be able to chime in on this as well, but uh, it's, it's super important when we look at the metaverse that it's not built and not maintained and owned by one central entity. So that's why everything that we're doing is really about creating um, open source tooling for not just creators, but developers as well. And basically for every participant in the network to have ownership over the metaverse. And also, you know, for us to work together with other platforms to really establish and push forth these standards that others can adopt to ensure the interoperability of 3D assets and experiences. Um, you know, and, and that's why also we love working with, with Filecoin, Protocol Labs, uh, NFT Storage, to ensure that the actual 3D assets through the process of having them be decentralized, um, you know, working with Filecoin and IPFS, it, you know, ensuring that these 3D assets are uh, built to last, like through history will be maintained and, and uh, having that assurance for artists that the work that you're creating uh, will be able to be preserved for years and years to come. Yeah. Do you guys have any thoughts about some of those kind of core concepts? What are some of the things that maybe resonate the most with you about the space as an artist, perhaps, Clara? Uh, can I pass that 
Yeah. I kick it to Annie too. <laughs> yeah, I think the ownership piece is important. Um, you know, I think I was really impressed by um, how Super Rare handled it. I think that we're yet to see other models, and I think there's a wide spectrum of how we can think about that, but. I thought it was incredible that when Super Rare launched their token that they gave a massive airdrop and contribution to every collector and every artist because those are the people that have built the value of that platform. And to see that recognized in such a massive way I think is really powerful because it promotes people to continue down the path in Web3 and encourages more experimentation and and more independence, both at, you know, to buy more art and to also create more art. And so I think that that ownership piece, I, I look forward to how that can continue to energize organizations and their whole communities and really create sustainability. Yeah, I think it's interesting. One of the questions that I have for you guys is the artists in this whole thing that we're talking about, right? There's all this technology and there's all this creativity and it's this, this really hodgepodge marriage of these things. But the artists are like, so if you look at the NFT kind of pop that just we're still experiencing, but that it was led by artists. It was led by, you know, why is it that artists tend to go first? Like in a broad sense, culturally, like with innovation, with, you know, you look at a lot of these social reforms and things like that, it's, it's powered by art and artists. I don't know if you guys have some perspective on that. Um, I think artists and sex workers lead every revolution. Um, <laughs> I think that um, artists are like kids in a lot of ways, right? We're imaginative and we think about things that might not even be possible, you know, and without the creativity and the ideas to really push boundaries and create new, uh, yeah, create new ways forward. It's like there, nobody would even like think to go in that direction, right? Like look how much of like real practical science is inspired by sci-fi, you know? Look how much of our modern culture is inspired by art from a hundred years ago or like how much our movies are inspired by Tolkien. It's like everything really did start with art, you know, in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I think it's really imperative for the artists to tell better stories around Web3 because I think that's how people really connect with those ideas. There's a lot of data that doesn't actually motivate action, but when you tell great stories, which is generally the artists uh, in a variety of formats, that that really enacts a lot of change. Um, as we're talking about this, like, we're coming out of, like, we talked about this as kind of, again, Web3 is the third iteration of this thing, right? <laughs> so to speak. Um, we can look back and see a lot of things that we wish we would have been able to see at the time, but we've learned a lot from each of these different sort of things. So we can look at Web2 and social, look at the attention economy and look at the ways that that has caused challenges. Um, not to debate any of that, that's not the place for this particular talk, um, but I think people have a good idea of that. What are some of the potential threats to this open interoperable experience that we're describing what are some of the things that could take this in a, in a direction that's dystopian or less than desirable? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of interesting to see, uh, we're seeing more and more sort of legacy Web2 brands enter the space now too. Um, and it's kind of interesting, I, I don't know if you guys have an opinion on this, but it, it sort of doesn't always feel authentic either. Um, you know, I think there's that certain ethos with Web3 and, and the community that we're all building together. And then you have like sort of a legacy brand come in and you know, their goal is really to be able to capitalize on everything and, and really leverage things to their advantage so that they can profit and succeed and, and really um, you know, beat out every other company and every other competitor. And that's like the total opposite of the ethos for Web3. So I think that you know, these legacy Web2 brands, not saying they're, they're all bad and I think there are some you know, really good examples of them going about it the right way too. But it is, a, it's, a, and it's a, an entire paradigm shift. You know, this whole notion of a rising tide lifts all ships that, that's not really, uh, you know, our, our entire economy is built on capitalism. So it's, you know, I, I think that, that definitely could be considered a threat. Um, but, you know, I think there are ways around it. And 
uh, you know, ways to circumvent that, but definitely, you know, seeing some examples of, of these legacy brands entering the space. I would, um, like, expanding on that, I, um, I completely agree in a lot of ways with the entrance of so many big, like, huge brands with so much brand power coming into the space and wanting a certain way to basically draw as much money as they possibly can from the space. It's, it's creating, an, like, an over-commodification and over-exploitation of artists, but it's also creating, like, a homogenization of the culture, right? Um, if you're only rewarding voices that speak into what's already popular, in the way of you know paying artists who are you know just making the exact same thing as everybody else instead of uplifting like queer and people of color and so many like voices from different communities um if we don't do that then we're just going to get another web too right dominated by companies and dominated by big brands and sure there might be new big brands that come out of web 3 but to keep the um part of decentralization alive. We have to uplift every community, not just the big ones. Yeah, that's imperative. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, if it's not if it's not by all of us, for all of us, like what are we doing here? Yeah. We've already got that other previous legacy system. We've got it already. We don't need to reinvent it. So uh, Annie, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Yes to all of that. And I think you know, one thing I try to stay informed on is regulations. I think we're charting a lot of new territory with finances, with, um, you know, legal structures and how we're setting up our businesses and doing experimental restructuring. And I think ultimately I just hope that uh, legislators worldwide um, continue to carve a path forward for us so that we can continue to experiment and be bold instead of having to continue to kind of, you know, shrink ourselves down to fit within a kind of web two financial box. Yeah, that's important. That's very important. Um, one thing I would love to touch on, web three always, you know, there's the word community in web three. Um, but I really do think, like, when we talk about the, like, you know, these, these potential threats to it, I think the differentiator is something that, that at Mona is, is very central, and that's the core community. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference that's made for you as an organization, as a group, as a company, and uh, what that means for the space? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, everything we do at Mona is, is really community first. Uh, and it's, it's really important to us that we really just listen to our community members who are these incredible and uh, you know, diverse creators from all across the world uh, and from all different backgrounds and experiences who are creating these incredible 3D worlds environments. Um, you know, and they're not just, uh, like, not just traditional 3D creators or traditional artists, but they're architects, they're game designers, artists from all backgrounds and, uh, you know, disciplines. And for us, it's really important to listen to all of our community members and really push forth and, and build the features that they want most. You know, without the community and without these creators, the platform wouldn't exist. So uh, for us, that's, that's the, the most important thing is that we're listening to what the community wants. And, uh, you know, we just kind of like help be that, that conduit for, for building this sort of vision of the open metaverse with everyone together. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, Claire, I don't know if potentially you can speak to, you know, what is it like to be a part of these online communities in these realities? Like, what are some of the, the things that that's, how's that? Um, I mean, it's amazing, right? Like, I have surrounded myself with so many really, really cool artists and people who I only would have known through Web3. Um, I think that it's created like global communities, you know, and um, just like, I don't know, I'm so, I'm just happy. <laughs> I, I come from a really small, well, not small, but it feels small. It's a, uh, it's a very conservative city in Canada, and it feels sometimes very lonely to not be surrounded by artists. And within Web3, I am surrounded by so many like amazing queer and so many different, you know, cultures and groups, uh, like artists, I don't know, <laughs> lots of artists. It's they're, they're really fun and it's hard to describe and that's what makes them really good artists. 
Um, and I, could, I could build on that too, like, because I, I went to art school and then, you know, post pandemic, like before the pandemic, you know, was working in a, at a couple studios, but then the pandemic hit, right? And it's incredible, like entering Web3 last year at the beginning of the year, um, just getting uh, involved with all these different communities of these different creators, like, uh, it was almost like being back in art school again and like seeing like all these amazing ideas and, and everything that everyone's creating and just how open everyone is with like sharing ideas and you know jumping through Twitter spaces and clubhouses and just like being involved with all the amazing artists in the community. It's, it's, it's incredible. Like it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, one last question to you, Annie, kind of on that same thing. Like, you know, really, you're a facilitator of community in so many really, really incredible ways for artists and stuff like that. What are some of the cool things that you've seen come out of community? Yeah, I was just thinking about, you know, even at ETH Denver, there, you know, we would have meetups, you know, at the conference or outside of the conference, and there was people that had been collaborating together on major projects some of them for a couple years who had never actually met before and it's really special to like see those hugs and you know see how real and in depth the relationships they've built are and then they're just now meeting in real life and it's really special um you know irls are really nebulous multi -com like we just love building bridges and because there's so many incredible communities already out there, so we often, you know, try to find ways to partner, you know, support one another in reciprocal ways, and have gotten to work with, you know, Meta Factory and the Museum of Crypto Art, and so many different incredible groups, and I think that just, you know, the people that, you know, for me too, there's people that I've worked with for that. We may never meet a lot of, and it's and it's a beautiful thing that people can remain anonymous and be who they want to be. And I think it's powerful, and you know, I got to meet one person that I have, has always been this like internet being, and a lot of our, his best friends have never met him, and I feel like kind of cool sometimes. I'm like, I got to meet him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy how the space, the relationships are so yeah. genuine. Um, we're out of time. I want to thank you guys so much. I want to leave you with this. There's a saying in the space, we're all going to make it. My thing, wag my, but together, that's the way. Word. Thank you guys. Thank you.